The following interview was conducted with Professor uh, J. Alfred Chiskin for the Purdue University Oral History Program. It took place on uh, Ma Tuesday, March the 4th, 2008, in Stewart Center, B26. The interviewer was Catherine Marquis, the Oral History Library. Welcome. Thank you. Thank Let's you. Let's tell us a little bit about where you were born and your parents and siblings in early years. Oh, goodness. Uh, I was born in a place called Kingston, Pennsylvania, which is across the Susquehanna River from wilkes barre which is near Scranton, and it's anthracite coal mining area and cotton mills, and that's what almost everybody did, and so my mother's first husband was killed in a rock slide in a mine, and uh, I worked for a while wondering what to do in life by mining coal. Uh, I didn't know what I wanted to do, but I knew I no longer wanted to mine coal, so I got out of Wyoming Valley and went to college which was 50 miles away and was the cheapest one around. What school did you go I to? I couldn't afford Purdue in this day and age. Uh, it was what, no, school, what school did you go Bloomsburg to? Bloomsburg State College. Okay. They're, they're majorly known academically for their remarkable wrestling teams, uh, okay. period. But at any rate, I did get an education of sorts. And Tell us about campus. Was it a large school? A it had 600 students. Is it a state school? Or when I arrived, there were 600 students. It's a state college, one of 13 sister colleges uh, with wonderful things, uh, sisters like Slippery Rock and all of those kind of names in weird places in Pennsylvania. So there were 600 students in the whole place. Uh, the year I retired, there were 1,600 students in my course at Purdue, uh, which shows you a lot uh, <laughs> without having to something. discuss it particularly. And um, what did you make? Did you live on campus? Yes. Did they have uh, dorms? Residences? Yes, yes, dirty, filthy. Uh, wonderful dorms where guys could do whatever they wanted to and did. And the women were, of course, sequestered like virgins and in their little <laughs> Interesting enclave. college life. Yes, with assisted deans of women with machine guns outside of every door. And they had to check in and check out and their very every movement was highly monitored uh, because they had to be wondrous elementary school teachers when they grew up. and. It was more of a teacher's college? Uh, it was at that time. Now now it's a liberal arts school. A very nice one, actually, a very good one. I, we give money to it. Um, but at any rate, I was a English and journalism major, creative writing major, sort of, although they didn't call it that at that time. Uh, and I was editor of the yearbook and newspaper and all of that sort of stuff. And in my senior year, I took this final journalism course and one of the assignments was to run to the library find an obscure an obscure journal you've never heard of in your whole life pretend you're starving to death uh, you want to write an article for this obscure journal research it thoroughly read the articles in it to find out who sells and then write an article and hand it in i did and i wrote it about cleaning skulls because that's what i was doing in a biology lab at the time because I was starving to death and that was the only job available in the whole blessed college. And so I took photos of all these skulls I had been cleaning for the comparative anatomy labs, et cetera, et cetera, and wrote it, handed it in, and the journalism prof wrote in red ink on it, uh, very interesting, why don't you uh, send it to the magazine? So, one always does when profs say, right? And so I sent it in and months went by and I got this envelope from Chicago that said, uh, we'd like to print your article, here's a check. If you send the, the uh, negatives in those days of your photos, we'll pay you even more cash. By more cash, I meant 15 bucks or something in those <laughs> days. Um, and I did, and months went by uh, and they sent me the second check, so I ran to my journalism props. You know, I could just smell the A-plus in the course and said, I'm published. <laughs> and he looked at the envelope and he said, do you realize that the envelope says Dr. J.A. Chiskin and you've misrepresented yourself as one of the faculty? And I said, I never said anything. I said, do you want to print this story? That's all I ever said. Uh, he said, well, you have to send the money back. Uh, and an apology. 
which I did. And months went by, <laughs> and w one day this envelope came from Purdue University, why, which is why I'm telling you this lengthy story. Do you know, Ginsdale, do you remember the name of the journal? Uh, School Science and Mathematics. And it was in an ugly green, which is what drew me to it originally. And because I said they have no color sense, whatever. And so I opened this big envelope, uh, and in it were application forms for graduate school to Purdue, with a note from the editor, a very brief note, uh, a few words that said, "Well, if you don't get a, if you don't have a PhD, get one." And I said, I've already signed up for a job in Maryland teaching sixth grade um, upon my graduation, and I put it away. And then a variety of profs said, you're stupid. At least fill it out. You never know. They might fire you in Maryland. And I filled it out. And I filled it out for the biology department because he was in the biology department at Purdue. And I had taken a few biology courses on top of everything. So, lo and behold, I got this letter a few months later that offered me a whole $1,500 a year uh, to come to Purdue and be a graduate teaching assistant. To me, $1,500 a year was like winning the lottery. And so I said, Lordy, <laughs> I'm, I'm coming. it took seconds to fill that thing out and, and send it back. And I looked up where Purdue was because everybody in the East Coast was telling me it was, they got it mixed up with Duke. And they said, it's in North Carolina, you'll love the spring. <laughs> and then I looked it up and I said, my God, it's near Chicago. Uh, you, and I said, you, you take a Greyhound bus to Chicago or something and then try to get to this Lafayette, Indiana. And in those days, Purdue advertised itself as not being in West Lafayette, but in Lafayette. And so I bought a one-way ticket on a Greyhound bus to go to Lafayette, Indiana, where they brought me. And they left me off on the other side of the Wabash River with luggage that was very heavy um, and no directions, whatever, and said, this is Lafayette. So I got off the bus. I asked people where Purdue was. Uh, and they pointed, they said, there's a very narrow bridge just around the corner from the Greyhound Terminal. Uh, and you go across the bridge, and there's a big steep hill, and you go up. And if you keep going, you're bound to notice it's a university. So I did. Um, and nobody told me that the Brown Street Bridge, which, thank God, they finally dynamited, um, <laughs> didn't have any sidewalks. And so there was traffic both ways on this blessed thing. And there I was with my heavy luggage, and everybody was beeping at me. Uh, and I finally got to Brown Street on the other side of the bridge and trudged up past this old bakery on the right-hand side. They used to make dreadful bread and biscuits and stuff. And finally got Grace to the bakery. campus where I found out where this wonderful man who had sent me this stuff had an office. So with two suitcases, I marched into Stanley Coulter Hall, which people directed me to, found his office. You're carrying, still carrying all your luggage? All the luggage. Well, what was I to do? I'd never been here before. Uh, I marched into his office, plumped down my uh, suitcases, and so help me, I probably said something incredibly stupid like, here I am, you know, as if... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know, some movie star just arrived on campus or something. And this guy looked at me and he said, yes. And I said, I'm Al Chiskin from Bloomsburg. And he said, yes. And he must have sent out thousands of these, or a secretary did, or somebody or other. He didn't remember me from a hole in the head. And I said, I filled out those forms you sent me. And he said, oh, that's very nice. I'm glad you're here, very politely, uh, and pretty coolly, actually. And he said, do you know what you want to do? And I said, be a grad student. And he said, in what? And I said, biology. And he said, son, do you realize that there are more 
departments or divisions of biology at this school than there are states in the union. And suddenly somebody much kinder, and a professor by the name of Alan Burdick, who's better known as Tex for some reason, swiveled around. He was the roommate of profs, used to have two people in each office. And he said, do you like genetics? And I said, so help me God, I said, well, I don't not like genetics. <laughs> uh, and tried dreadfully to remember almost anything I had ever been taught about it, which wasn't terribly much. And he said, which do you prefer, tomatoes or fruit flies? And I said, I really don't know, uh, but I like plants. And he said, good, you are now a tomato geneticist. You are now my grad student. Uh, these are the courses you're going to take. Go register uh, in uh, Hovde Hall, or the Arbory, actually, by Hovde. And uh, meet me here uh, tomorrow at such and such a time, which I did. And I was 21 years old and overnight became a tomato geneticist. I didn't know what the hell you did being a tomato geneticist. I had eaten tomatoes and that was it. <laughs> and, and so I sort of became one. And what year was this? I now? wasn't particularly okay. interested in it. But what year was this when you came? 1954, August, uh, September 9th, 1954. Okay. And then, now, and where I was did 21. What, about, what about housing? What were you going to do with your suitcases? Well, after you became the geneticist, people assured, I kept stopping people outside of the Hall of Music and saying, What do you do if you can't? don't have a place to stay. And they directed me to the Dean of Students office, which had a list of nice little old women with binoculars who wanted to rent out their bedrooms. Okay, that's all there were in those days. There were not apartment houses. There were rooms. There were rooms <laughs> in somebody's home whose husband had died centuries before they needed the cash. And so I struggled into one of these uh, one after the other after the other. There weren't any available at the time. I was late. I didn't know this, but you, you're supposed to do this in the spring before you arrive, just like now. And so I trudged with my suitcases to the only place that was left that was on the other side of the Brown Street Bridge from whence I had come. Uh, to Brown Street, where, where the house still stands. It must be 150 years old by now. And this little lady said, of course, we'd love to have you stay with us. And she was very kind and lovely and, and you know, fed me food at midnight when I was studying and all this stuff. And I stayed there a while until I found a place on this side of the river, which she said I would and knew this was going to happen. And she even drove me to the new place I had just uh, uh, rented on Harrison Street, I guess. Okay which is now a big apartment house. Uh, they tore down the... The houses. They didn't save it in case I became president. <laughs> so... <laughs> now you're a geneticist. We'll tell about grad and then get it staying on at Purdue. Grad okay. school? Yeah, and then... Well, I left a mother and a grandmother. Uh, my father had blown town when I was about two. Uh, and moved to Florida and had another family. Uh, I suspect at first not totally legally and then eventually legally. And he named his first son me. Uh, and maybe 10 years ago, my wife was on the computer and said, there can't be very many Chiskins in this country, right? And I said, no, it's an Ellis Island name. It's a made up name that people gave us when we emigrated you know, in the early 1900s. And they said, well, here are the uh, Chiskins. There seems to be a lot of them in Florida. And I looked and they said, there's a Joseph Chiskin. And there's another Joseph Chiskin. And my name is J. Joseph Alfred Chiskin. So I got on the phone and I s called this guy in Florida. And I said, is Joseph Edward Chiskin there? And he said, no, he's dead now. And I said, well, which one are you? And he said, and I said, well, I think you're my brother uh, or half-brother. 
And he said, nah. So I told him all about what my father was and where he was and what he has done. And he said, oh my God, you know. And his wife screamed, it's just like Oprah. Uh, <laughs> and that's, we have nothing in common. At the age of 50-something, he surfs. Uh, I don't surf on the Wabash. We have next to nothing in common, whatever. Have but you it's met? nice to know have you met? Have the you ever genes met? go on. Did, hmm? did you ever meet? No. Oh. We talk on the phone, oh. usually around Christmas, and play catch-up that we're still alive and things. <laughs> uh, again, we have nothing to talk about. I mean, he, he, he mows lawns uh, uh, near the Kennedy Space Center a few hours a week most of the year, and then he surfs, which I find delightful. I think that's wonderful. But I know nothing about surfing, and he certainly knows nothing about genetics. And so, so <laughs> life's that way. It's a holiday greeting. Yeah. <laughs> OK, go ahead, and then continue on. So now you're at Purdue, and you I'm a grad finish. student, and I started teaching in a principal's biology course for an old professor not far from retirement called Davy Dunham, uh, who was on his like George Bush on his way out, one prays, and strike that. And uh, the uh, job was boring. Uh, the, the guy in 1955 was teaching remarkably accurate 1932 uh, biology. Uh, to, to him, DNA was Dana. You know, he had no clue what to do with that <laughs> phrase. Um, and he was still teaching ancient Mendelian genetics with peas and stuff and claiming this was state of the art science. And, and most of it was descriptive, and we dissected fetal pigs and earthworms and all that wonderful stuff. Uh, and I had some, uh, I taught most of the football players. My first uh, student at Purdue was Len Dawson. Uh, and one day, Len and I walked over to get our checks. And I looked down, and his check was more than mine. And I said, what do you do at Purdue? And he said, I mow lawns. And I said, but it's November. <laughs> and I said, he said, that's the way it is, man. <laughs> and so it taught me a few things. Uh, Never underestimate your students. They're probably getting paid more than you are. Uh, uh, that was true of some fam now famous basketball player the year before I retired uh, who came to my office because I called him in because he had never quite bothered to ever come to any of my classes. And I said, you really ought to. I'm sure you have potential and all that stuff that profs tell students. And he looked at me and he said, Dr. Al, in five years, I'll have made more money than you will between the day you were born and the day you die. <laughs> and he's, he was right. In five years, he most certainly did, probably in less time than that. And he now owns half of northern Indiana and is giving millions to Gary and all that kind of stuff. So never underestimate students. Mm -hmm. Never underestimate anybody, really. Yeah. Okay. So. Uh, so I had the Holmec girls. It was Holmec in those days. And most of their major ambitions at the time were to find a rich engineer to be. And then the phys ed, who most of their ambitions were to uh, get some sort of recognition so they could go out in the big world and make tons of money, which many of them did. Uh -huh. And that's to their great credit. And I did this for, you know, quite a few years. But David Dunham and a variety of other profs were there at all the wrong times. Uh, they had seen their day, and molecular something called molecular biology was coming into play now. They knew nothing about molecular biology. They didn't want to. That's not how they were trained. That's not how they taught. Uh, they tried. Uh, they weren't terribly successful at it uh, in the same way that I'm computer illiterate. <laughs> uh, my wife uh, receives all my emails, prints them out. I write in red ink my reply, and she sends it back to whoever was dumb enough to email me. <laughs> and um, you know that's the way that world turns. Uh, and molecular biology was sweeping into Purdue and into our department. That's where the federal money was. 
uh, from the National Institute of Health and the National Science Foundation. New profs were being hired that were like young and knowledgeable and worthy of grant support and they were coming with hundreds and thousands of dollars worth of grants. These guys never got a grant doing anything. And I was very sorry for them because you could see that their world had suddenly crumbled. Um, and it was an awkward time because you went to teach for these people at the same time that people were urging you to do state-of-the-art research right across the aisle someplace elsewhere in Purdue. And it was a fascinating time, but it was, I thought, an educationally sad time to watch these people uh, not so subtly being uh, minimized, uh, told that the sooner they retired, the better it would be without a compensatory package of if you retire five years early, we'll you know, give you certain benefits you ordinarily would not have earned, et cetera, et cetera, uh, which Purdue is still reticent to do after all these years. IU does it all the time. Mm -hmm. And um, Were you continuing to work on your, your graduate work at the same time we were teaching? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and after a year, I really became bankrupt because I left behind a mother and a grandmother who were elderly and getting uh, couldn't work as much as the, uh, my mother used to. And so I would send most of my paycheck home uh, and try to live on the on the rest. I assure you, uh, when I went to the bathroom at, in my uh, various boarding houses, you had to supply your own toilet paper. Well, uh, thanks to the union, <laughs> I had ample supplies of it, which I took home in my briefcase, uh, as did every grad student I knew, male or female, uh, in those days. You, sure. you, when you went for sugar uh, down the uh, things here, you, you took numerous packets, not just one, et cetera. Uh, so I went to my major professor and said, I can't make it on 1500 a year. I'm very sorry. It's been a thrill. I'm glad I was here. I'll never forget it. Uh, and uh, he said, well, suppose I could figure out a way to make you work full time. And I said, you do that. <laughs> you know, feel free to call. Um, and he went to the head of the department, uh, who was up to that point had never, I'm sure, known I existed. Um, and the head of the department went to uh, Hovde, uh, who was president. And Havdi said, it's never been done before, <laughs> uh, to his knowledge. Uh, and this sets a dangerous precedent, which it certainly probably did. Uh, but I was told that if I worked all year long, I could get 300 a month, which to me was a preposterous amount of money. Uh, I sent even more home, and I could still live on you know, some of that, et cetera. And in the meantime, uh, uh, one of my fellow grad students, a woman by the name of Mary Stiller, who is now a, a, a practicing nun without the bother of getting one uh, at St. Thomas Aquinas, uh, was a big deal in science at that time, as she was the grad student of all grad students. And she, uh, we started at the same time, and she finished her PhD long before I did, and when she went to the University of Chicago, uh, she sent me money uh, every month for a while until this came through about the 300 a month. And uh, she'll, she's one of the few people in life I'll never forget. Uh, she's still here now. Um, but at any rate, I taught full time. So I would teach for numerous professors, teaching numerous courses. Um, uh, one year I taught four different, you know, assisted in four different courses uh, uh, that overlapped very slightly, really. So that meant a lot of preparation time, etc. But it was fun. I, I found out that as opposed to coal mining, I really dug uh, teaching. I love the students and I love the interactions and the one-on-ones and 
and I really learned a lot of biology very quickly because there's no better way of learning anything than having to teach it uh, to some people who are more than willing to show you up if they know more than you do because they read two chapters more than you did. <laughs> and, uh, so I, I learned because when I started taking courses here, I went to all these lectures I did not comprehend at all. And I went to exams and I looked at the questions and I did not understand at all. Like I studied and studied and studied and I said, where are the questions that I studied for? And in a population genetics course, this prof, prof gently stopped me in the hallway when I quizzed him about this, uh, having done terribly in his recent test. And he said, you just haven't, you're naive, he said, and you just haven't comprehended yet that if you study your buns off at this point in your life, you go into the exam having finally learned all the stuff everybody else here knew before they started studying for their exam and are therefore miles ahead of you. And so why should I ask questions on what they already learned in their sophomore year at Purdue or someplace as opposed to you at Bloomsburg State College? Interesting. <clears throat> and so he said, it will change, but it's not going to change soon. And that gave me a clue that I needed a hell of a lot more patience than I thought I ever had. And it was, it was two, three years before I felt I could, with some uh, assurance, walk into an exam at this place. Uh, but it happened. And, uh, you made the mark. Yeah, but I made the mark because an awful lot of uh, profs at Purdue allowed me to, you know. Uh, it wasn't just football players that perhaps at that time were getting a good deal. <laughs> uh, a lot of people uh, went out of their way to uh, say things like, well, make sure that you don't just stop here in your reading, or right. it will work out, or you'll do better in the next test, or whatever. Yeah, that support thing, yeah. that lift up. Right. Yeah, and uh, that made at least telling me that they knew that there were problems and that I wasn't the only one. Right. You know, that they, uh, my major professor told me that they had taken a chance on me when they approved me in the biology department. And he said, look, think about it. Why in the world would they have allowed you to come to Purdue? They looked at the courses you took and they said, he's applying in biology. His last course was in journalism in which he got an A. <laughs> you know, uh, why would we take this young man? And they said, because you were interesting. And so they take X amount of interesting people. And I rem remember that all the days of my life here uh, because numerous students applied to the weirdest places and I kept saying, why? Why are you applying here? And there wasn't any real reason <laughs> that they could think of. This was just something they had just thought of for some reason or another. And one of my favorite paragraphs was which I used over and over was you are probably wondering why <laughs> you know and I said take a chance it won't kill you you know there must be subspaces you allow and most universities do for sure, all sorts of sure. people right you know? yeah tell us a little bit about your course and some of the work that you've done uh, the manuals you've written a lot of manuals for some of the courses in the early years, but your big one was that social impact of biological sciences. Yeah, that was a course. I was on sabbatical at the Carnegie Institution in Washington, and they had my department, Henry Koffler, uh, who's probably the most pivotal scientist in my life, uh, called He was the me. head of the department at one Yeah, department. yeah. Uh -huh. And he went on to become vice president at Minnesota and then president at uh, Massachusetts and then pre he retired as president at Arizona and he's now still there. Um, but he called me and said the campus is in turmoil. This was the hippie movement. Um, there are numerous coffee houses in the village. <laughs> uh, people wore, if they wore clothes at all at any given time, they, they wore the most interesting clothes they could come up with. Uh, they no longer liked anything or appreciated almost anything about the university. Uh, Havde got up at a coffee house and said, honest, I care, and people yelled back, 
you may care, but you don't know what in the world you care about. <laughs> you know, there was just no uh, communication, whatever. Uh, there actually was a riot outside the armory during graduation, uh, the Vietnamese War, the Civil Rights Movement, everything was up for grabs. Um, the mall was filled with tents with all sorts of interesting logistics behind it. Uh, there were uh, hundreds of naked roller skaters going down State Street at eight in the evening. Uh, it, it was a fa it was the closest Purdue came to being really interesting, <laughs> and uh, never been the same since. Um, but anyway, I got this thing saying the liberal arts students at Purdue don't like any biology course under God's green earth. Uh, do something about it. And I said, like what? And he said, I don't care, but when you get back to, uh, to Purdue from Washington, uh, start something that liberal arts majors will like, and while you're at it, uh, why don't you take over the management majors, because uh, they don't see any relevance between running uh, Ford Motor Company and dissecting an earthworm, I guess. And uh, <coughs> so I had been in Washington and I had written parts of speeches for first uh, Teddy Kennedy. That lasted a very short period of time, <laughs> uh, almost milliseconds. And um, then for Nelson Rockefeller, who thought he wanted to be president. And uh, and I, that never, none of that particularly materialized very successfully, uh, but uh, I got to go to a lot of uh, committee meetings and cocktail parties and met a lot of people I never would have met at just staying in the back of a lab at Carnegie. And uh, so I found out that everybody was arguing about things in Washington that I was mentioning in my courses in biology. Everything from abortion to cancer to biochemical warfare to uh, uh, birth defects to AIDS to this to that, uh, you name it. Uh, we didn't dwell on it because we still had to do the traditional biology, but I certainly tried to throw it in to make stuff interesting. And so I proposed to Henry Koffler that when I got back I would teach, I wanted to teach a small experimental course for maybe, I don't know, what's a small classroom, 25, 30 people. Uh, and he said, what about a mid-sized classroom for 60? And I said, okay, we'll compromise. Um, I'll come back and I'll, I'll start this. Uh, I would like a laboratory. The liberal arts school did not want a laboratory. That was too scientific for liberal arts at the time. Uh, they, they just couldn't cope with the thought. It's like if you're a theater major, God knows you should never be in a play. <laughs> you know, if, if you, you want to go into television, my God, you should never make a short on television for somebody. Um, so I said, okay, we'll, we'll do it as a, a lecture format uh, with discussion sessions. Can I have discussion sessions? So they said, yes, you can have discussion sessions. Uh, so that's what we all compromised on for 60 people. I got back from, wa from Washington, and they had already enrolled over 600. And I said, I don't even have my first lecture done, and I'm supposed to get up and teach 600 people stuff, <laughs> you know. Um, do you know how many more TAs you need to teach, teach 600 with you than you need to teach 60? I didn't need any TAs to do 60. Uh, I needed help <laughs> to do 600 plus. The year after that, it was 1,200. Uh, my highest enrollment pushed 1,700. I gave every lecture in the uh, big lecture room in Lilly Hall. I, I quadrupled each uh, lecture. I gave it each lecture four times. Uh, students didn't understand what in the world I was saying in lecture one. They had three other opportunities. <laughs> they could come and hear the same blessed thing. Um, 
you know, almost drove me suicidal. Uh, it's like doing four matinees if you're in theater, you know, on this on Wednesday. <laughs> and you just don't do that uh, with, with great enthusiasm after a while. But I did it, and it was, it turned out to be very rewarding and fulfilling and fun and whatever. And I think, I, and there's some evidence for it, that I turned on all sorts of students. Um, uh, between my wife and I, we still receive thousands of emails and letters and Christmas cards and, you know, every year uh, for some reason or another. Um, in the alumni magazine that just came out, somebody at, in Michigan just wrote, you know, if it hadn't been for Neidhart and Chiskin's course, where, you know, would I have been? So it was nice. Mm. Um, but the, the students were uh, not about to sit there and take notes. Uh, they challenged you constantly. Uh, even if they totally agreed with what you had just said, they pretended they didn't because that was the era of discontent. Uh, it's still a wonder I survived it because the chances were as good I wouldn't survive, I thought. Uh, for example, uh, my students objected to going to a recitation class in which you sat in these chairs while somebody stood up front and wrote things on a green board. We had now highly evolved at Purdue from blackboards to green boards, which to Purdue seemed re quite remarkable. Uh, and so my, my head TA and I went down to Sears Roebuck, which was having a big sale, and we bought mattresses. We threw out all the chairs in the hallway and put flung mattresses all over the floor, uh, went to uh, pennies and got uh, psychedelic uh, mattress, uh, whatever you call them, not pads, but mattress uh, sheets, covers, covers yes. Yeah. So there were stripes and polka dots and weirdos and all sorts of things, and it was just a wave of color. And uh, President Hansen's wife came over to stare at this in total disbelief uh, because. Lo and behold, one of the first students to walk in, I think, was one of the Hanson kids. Uh, it took milliseconds before the president of the university heard about it. The business office got this thing from the biology department that said, uh, we want reimbursement uh, for so many <laughs> mattresses for room so and so. <laughs> and they called the head of my department and said, about these mattresses, and the head of my department, of course, said, what mattresses? He, he knew darn well what mattresses. He lied through his teeth. Uh, <laughs> never heard of this before in his whole life. All sorts of people from the business management of the university to Mrs. Hansen came bopping over to my recitations. But you walked in, and my students were, it was like a, Greek orgy or a Roman orgy. They were lolling in various uh, <laughs> attitudes, uh, <laughs> sipping and eating. And But you stood outside the door, and there were 10 people trying to talk at the same time. Uh, it was a very fervent, lively group. And it worked. And at due time, the mattresses went. Because <laughs> uh, the students, of course, now that we had mattresses, they didn't want mattresses in about eight years, but it took eight years, and you, you, you sort of did it. I gave my exams in the, uh, all the big lecture rooms simultaneously on campus, uh, one of which was in 1105 in, Li in Lily Hall. And this group of kids came in, and he said, we, we, we are a band on campus. And there's nothing to do after your tests. <laughs> and I almost said, well, what does this have to do with my life? Uh, but they said, why don't you announce that we'll play down in the front of 1105 for uh, one hour 
after the exam, and people who are taking exams in other places can drift over if they they want, etc. And there'll be coffee machines and whatever on the hallways, so that you know they can get uh, like refreshments. And in my total naivete, I said. That actually doesn't sound like a dreadfully bad idea. Uh, why don't you do that? Uh, and so the test ended, and they came in, and they started playing, and students gathered, and after maybe 20 minutes, you couldn't see the students <laughs> because there was a deep haze on the horizon. <laughs> and I just... I wasn't very religious at that point in my life. I just prayed to God <laughs> that the police would not show up in the midst of what obviously was a drug haven at the moment. They had mentioned that minuscule part of uh, the okay. program. Uh, they assumed it was commonplace, they told me later. Uh, well, I did not know that later. so. Uh, but people were, you know, my, my colleagues in biological sciences were working late and some of them were walking by and they smelled this. You know, they opened the door and looked in and the psh came out after them. And that was the talk of the, the university for quite a while there, that and the mattresses. The mattress story lives on, it will never end. Oh, that's great. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. You, really, the focus of your has been students, and you've really been involved with. Now, did you cha how much did you change your course over time? You oh, it evolved did. constantly. Right. It had to it had because to. <laughs> what if its attractiveness was uh, there was a right a rice and square a scare out in where Las Vegas or someplace. Right. Uh, the, if you're got, ever going to bring up rice and that, this is the time to do it. Uh, what is rice and where does it come from? Of what value is it? Of what harm is it? Right. Uh, what is it politically good for? If you're a terrorist, would you like it? Uh, if you're a member of the CIA, would you want to know all you can about it? Uh, you know. Uh, and, and so the poli sci majors and the this major and the, and the corporate management majors wanted to know about uh, things that happened like yesterday, if not today. And it was a glorious era if you were teaching because uh, it, it was Chernobyl and it was uh, the uh, radiation in Pennsylvania and uh, we had wars galore and there it was biochemical warfare in Vietnam and Agent Orange and a dioxin and this and that. Uh, the AIDS epidemic just blew up uh, while I was teaching uh, and from something insignificant apparently grew into something momentous in nature. Uh, th there was just a lot more discovered about birth defects and uh, and that even the most pedestrian thing that you think everybody's in favor of can have numerous uh, areas of thought about it. Uh, even things like, you know, you held your breath every time it came up, but even things like abortion. Uh, there are these people who think uh, it is necessary, there are these people who think this this group should go to hell yesterday again. Um, and, and after a while, when you started pointing out that everyone who smokes a cigarette at Purdue and exposes somebody to secondhand smoke must be in favor of abortion, because it very likely, within 10 years, will be shown to uh, cause this in certain people. And this is a calculated choice. Every time you sit on a bar stool on your buns and drink alcohol which goes into your blood, which goes into your testicles, or goes into your ovary and into your eggs to be, what do you think happens to them? They get drunk, uh, they form your next child. How? How many genetic mutations? You know, how many dis developmental uh, disabledness? Uh, are there going to be. Right. Uh, the simple fact that if you took a hundred uh, men and a hundred women statistically with perfect sperm and perfect eggs in terms of being able to get together and make a child and you gave them each five bucks and said go to it make a child 
then three, no, two thirds of those newly made unions of sperm and eggs would be aborted. But we call it spontaneous abortion, and doctors who are kind tell the mothers that they have miscarried. There is no such thing as miscarriage in the medical jargon. It's a kind word used by kind physicians that don't want to tell the mother and the father that they screwed up. And if they didn't, then they allowed their government, their fellow taxpayers, you know, their representatives to Congress, <laughs> you know, to screw up. Uh, they screwed up their life. They voted for them. <laughs> yeah, right, right. So it, it does matter. That's right. <clears throat> Um, let's talk. You were some of the presidents, Hovde and Hansen and Dr. Baring. So you did you get did you get to know any of them? Oh yeah, very well. Okay. Yeah, I I, I taught some of the Hovde kids, some of the Hansen kids, uh, none of the rest. Uh, we we my wife and I are Martha and I are not were never noted on campus for being uh, withdrawn <laughs> um, and when we felt strongly about something we felt why worry with the about the with the small people go go to you know manage to be in the right place at the right time but just happened to bring it up um, just as we almost immediately accosted our new president with a why do all these committees you've just created have no Ret Purdue retirees on them whatsoever. You know, like, do you realize that in five years you're out of here and you're going to be a Purdue retiree? <laughs> uh. So we, we managed to meet and all the right about people. Your family. You met your wife here? Too. Yes, I, I, I was extremely active in the civil rights movement of the uh, early to mid 60s. Uh, and so I was there during the Birmingham riots, and I was in the Selma march, and I was at Martin Luther King's thing in Washington, and uh, uh, I was in prison briefly in Birmingham, and all that uh, stuff, which is now ancient history. Uh, we now have a African American running for president, for God's sake, whoever would have thought it. Uh, but. Um, when I got back, the first thing anybody told me was, in fact, Mary Stiller told me, there is a beautiful red-headed woman who's just been hired by Koffler and is going to work with you in one of your courses. And then she walked in. And five years later, we got married. <laughs> Good. You know. yeah, and you have a couple of children, too, don't you? Yes, okay. they're adopted. Mm -hmm. uh, one is, our son is triracial. He's part American Indian. Uh, this was activated highly by the Civil Rights Movement. Uh, they were adopted from the Lafayette region because nobody, frankly, else wanted them. And we lived next to the LeBolds. And she was very active in trying to place children who were too old or too something uh, uh, to be uh, instantly adoptable. And they were already starting to go downhill visually and whatever. Uh, and so uh, she would bring them home with her, in essence, and they would miraculously tend to visit our house. <laughs> uh, hint, hint. <laughs> and so and we fell in love with the two of them and uh, a adopted them. Um, my wife had to announce after one of her lectures that she had to run home and uh, get get her uh, her new child, uh, <laughs> which stunned her, stu that, right. stunned her students. Yeah, yeah. and uh, but our our son is part American Indian and part black and part white. Our daughter is uh, part black and part white, and and, uh, and has found her biological parents and uh, uh, has all of these networkings out sure. now, which is. Very nice. So there are great they go, ups and downs. Yeah. Did they go to Purdue? Did they? Uh, they both went to Purdue. Our do our daughter was graciously asked to leave. 
<laughs> uh, she attended every party at Purdue and never quite made any of the tests. Uh, are, are uh, like many other students uh, who find themselves in later life. Uh, she now was just named the best student in a psych course uh, this semester at IUPUI and uh, is going to graduation to get her two-year degree uh, and will go on. And then now she's talking about law school and Good. all of this. So being in her 30s is not the same as being in your teens, obviously. Uh, and that's true for many students who come to Purdue. Mm -hmm. You can't give up on them. Our son uh, graduated from Purdue uh, and now is uh, a recruiter-advisor for the graduate school at uh, DeVry University, and, uh, which is a mostly online university. And most of his uh, disciples are in Iran, and I mean in Iraq and Afghanistan, uh, trying to make a life, future life for themselves should they survive those two wars. Hmm. Uh, they're, they're working on advanced degrees, MBAs, or, you know, or whatever. That, that astonished me somehow. But, yeah, I would say you know, so, it's, yes. It's, it's true. Um, let me talk about the, um, uh, you've had some, the School of Science deans. You had Dr. Clark, was or was the, um, you mentioned uh, Koffler. Were there any others that, or uh, the, the deans that uh, while you were there? After well, Koffler was head of our department. Okay. He turned down the deanship um, when Felix Haas left. Uh, Felix Haas is a dear friend uh, still. He's, uh, and he uh, was a very catalytic head of the department. I don't think he totally comprehended uh, till the day he departed uh, what people like Postal Ways and Martha and I were trying to do. Uh, you know, he would take me aside and say, what is all this about uh, uh, audio tutorial? Uh, like, what do you do? What does he do uh, in all of this? And, and I would try with some patients uh, to explain to them how potentially useful it was in education. Sure. I was going to ask you about that. In the audit tutorial mm -hmm. was, you, uh, Dr. Postelway was involved in that. Yes, and thanks you did to Henry Koffler who right. managed to finance him through all of this, but not easily. It was uh, all of these battles. Were, the School of Science almost did not, by faculty vote, almost did not approve the course I taught so successfully. Uh, we literally had to go and uh, convince colleagues of ours to go to the meetings. Nobody goes to school of science meetings unless they're really bored. Uh, and so you know, half the biology contingent showed up to take exception to and take exception to until my course was finally passed, but it just barely passed. <laughs> Herb Brown, who got the Nobel Prize, I think went to his first school of science meeting uh, ever <laughs> uh, to be against my course uh, because he thought the School of Science should be a research institution uh, that if you, if you want to uh, uh, be taught so grandly, you want to go to IUPUI uh, or, or go to Ivy Tech or whatever. Uh, and that climate prevails more and more today, of course, with our most recent administration through JISCI and mm -hmm. stuff. Yeah. The, um, oh, one of the things that uh, I want to ask you about the Jesse Singleton Award for Undergraduate Research, does that still go on? Because yes. I understand that uh, you, the principles of biology, he's the one that originated that, didn't he? Yes, and yeah. without which I would never be here. Uh -huh. uh, is that uh, award uh, still going? Uh, do you yes, know? it is, uh -huh. yes. Uh, Singleton was a brilliant man, uh, died very prematurely uh, of pancreatic cancer at, in his early 40s. Uh, I taught for him. Uh, and and event, uh, I was about to leave Purdue with my PhD, and I was down in the drugstore, the artist's drugstore that used to be on State Street, and eating my bean soup and toast. Uh, and Singleton walked by, did a double take, came in, and he said, uh, what are you doing when you get a degree? And I said, I'm leaving here. I've signed a contract in Florida at the University of. And he said, well, suppose uh, I asked you if you want to stay and start a new laboratory with me uh, and I do the lectures because we want to uh, do away with this botany zoology micro uh, system which is archaic now and 
teach the principles and the concepts of uh, biology across all of these sub-disciplines. Uh, the, the really big concepts like reproduction and feedback and whatever. And uh, I said, I've signed a contract in Florida. By the time I got back, having eaten my bean soup and uh, to toast, I got my office and Henry Koffler came down and said, essentially, we've talked to Florida, uh, we've talked to their lawyers, <laughs> uh, you can stay if you wish. Uh, we found out what they were paying you. My offer is, <laughs> and, and so it was a good lunch. You know, at, at, at which I said, Henry, never let it be said I can't be bought. <laughs> 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 and, and so I stayed and, and did. I, I originated his laboratories. I wrote the manuals. Uh, shortly thereafter, I was in Missouri talking about the course at some college. Uh, heard from his wife that he had died on the operating room table, essentially. And uh, I wrote to Henry Koffler saying that I'm the only one that knows anything about this course. They, I thought he'd make a big mistake if he didn't put me in charge of it, uh, other than the fact that I killed to get in charge of it. Uh, and I knew I was overstepping, but I, I didn't know what else to do at the time. And he called and said, I never thought otherwise, and so I suddenly, you know, became in charge of this course that I had no right to be in charge in it, of in that, at that age. I was very young, all these things, when I was very young, and uh, it, it was a Principles of Biology course that also became very, very successful, Good. and was one of the first in the country. Uh, Stanford and Berkeley had done it, uh, UChicago was in some way attempting to do it. Uh, and we were right up there as leaders in education, the biological world. Very good. Uh, let's talk a couple of the, um, you got that Purdue Alumni Award the, for students, uh, innovation and helping students learn about that, and you got the Amico Foundation Award. Are you in the Teaching Academy as well? Yes, yes. we were, okay. my wife and I both were in the first class of the Teaching Academy, okay. which, which we think very highly yes. of. Um, they managed to hide the plaque amazingly well on, on a side hallway in the in the union where hardly anybody goes. Uh, Unless really, you're coming out of the nobody, South Ballroom. You know, hardly anybody goes to that entrance. Uh, so they, they really must have looked hard to find a place to hang that <laughs> so <laughs> nobody would know it exists. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, very nice. it, it was a nice uh, yes. gesture on the part of the University. It right. didn't bring any pay raises, I hasten to point out. <laughs> uh, it, it, it didn't mean that um, we, we could pay off the bank loan. Uh, it just meant that. Uh, it's an honor. It's that, an honor. Right. And yeah. Tell us a little yeah. about that, uh, the Chiskin honor that uh, you and your wife set up in the school. Tell us a little for, for the outstanding teachers in biological sciences, how that came about. Well, we didn't set it up so much oh. as it was set up around us. Um, <laughs> I have very mixed feelings about it. Uh, the first thing was that I think the vast majority of money that is raised uh, should be going to build Discovery Park so much as going to students who can't afford to go to college. Um, when you think of how much money has just been paid to a, a wonderful basketball coach who cheats in Indiana, uh, how many scholarships could have sent Indiana youth to uh, Bloomington on that amount of money, for example? Uh, and I felt the same way about uh, many of the buildings that have been built that are structures uh, where the money is going to come from to maintain them is highly debatable. <laughs> uh, but certainly not for me, oh, <laughs> that's for sure. Um, and so when it came time for us to retire, it was at the same time that President Jiski, who is a wonderful man and raised billions of dollars, no doubt, and I commend him highly. But nevertheless, the whole atmosphere at Purdue was, if you can't make money on this, don't bother me with it. Um, and so every everybody down, you know, uh, uh, was trying to raise money. And, and I'm sure that the head of our department, frankly, uh, thought 
the Chiskins are retiring, we should be able to do something with this. And so they created an undergraduate teaching award because we taught. But if there hadn't been students, we wouldn't have taught. And if the students weren't any good and weren't of any value, we would have left it, you know, many years ago. I mean, I, I, I left after 45 years of teaching, for heaven's sake. There was a reason for my staying. It certainly wasn't financial. <laughs> and um, so I thought it should be a, a, a student scholarship who is interested in interdisciplinary uh, work between liberal arts, for example, the theater and biology and that sort of stuff. Um, but it, he didn't see it that way. It, it, it was, uh, this money will go back to the department and it will go to one of us so we could do research with the money we're going to make out of this teaching award. And I was old by then and I just wanted out. And I could have fought it and probably should have but we didn't. Uh, Martha had two years left to go. Uh, I said, if that's what the department wants to do uh, with, with the money they're going to raise, but it was a method to raise money just like everything else around here is. Uh, sorry about that, Dr. Jiski. <laughs> but uh, it is. Uh, and so the head of the department could then dutifully report that people were giving money uh, which would, be, which would go to professors, and for the most part, they were research professors, uh, some of whom I agreed with, some of whom I didn't, uh, some of whom couldn't teach their way out of them. Never mind, but they certainly wouldn't have gotten my teaching award if it had been my money. Uh, but, you know, that, that's the way it sure. is. And it's, this isn't better or anything. That's politics in a university. Right, yeah. uh, and we give money to it. You know, uh, we, we gave it from the beginning, and we were named the first recipients. Right. Uh, and teaching was held such high accord that Martha and I were named simultaneously, uh, like we were married. Um, I was retiring, but she wasn't yet. But we were named simultaneously as the first recipients of this award. Uh, the award was to be given, it, it was 1000 or $1,200 to the person, who, the person who won it. We each got 600 uh, That's how important it all was. Uh, they did give us each 1000 which isn't a lot of money anyway. Uh, th they actually split it in half because, like, there were two of us. Uh, in addition to this, they took out income tax. And so by the time we got the money, uh, we could have made a good trip to Marsh's and, and loaded up. On, you know, and I said, you know, but people have sent in thousands of dollars. Some very nice former students of mine uh, who are now corporate executives and stuff like this uh, gave uh, very kind amounts of money. Uh, and I'm happy for all of this at that level. And I love Purdue, and uh, it's been my life, and I'm you know, glad money is coming into Purdue. Right. Yeah. But all is not what it always seems. Right. <laughs> Tell us a little bit about retirement. What have you been doing in retirement? Anything but uh, I should say as little as humanly possible. Okay. All my life I've been very interested in theater and uh, that sort of stuff. And in fact, in my course, I actually hired TAs from the theater department to come and take plays and other stuff that, uh, portions of them that uh, uh, playwrights had uh, used their knowledge of biology to construct this portion of the play, you know, the Tennessee Williamses of the world, etc., and uh, cast it and the television studio here filmed it. Uh, they still exist. And um, I showed them to my classes and I said, you know, when you talk about genetics, you know, well, uh, you know, here's our town with Thornton Wilder. This is what the minister says when he gets up. You listen to this. It's what I lectured on last time. Um, Enrichment to the class. Yeah. Right. And. Uh, that also became well known on campi, uh, that sort of stuff. Um, well, anyway, 
this wasn't your question. The question was, uh, what do I do? And, and I said, that's sort of it. I, I've, a lot of my students are in television now. Uh, when they need a bald, fat, old man, uh, guess who they call? <laughs> <laughs> and I go, uh, my only uh, uh, requirement is I refuse to say the name of whatever it is they are advertising. But if they need a bald, fat, old man, uh, th then you know I, I go out and do it for them. Um, so I've done ver varying commercials around the state and, and certainly in this local community. And, well, that's uh, very good. I'm glad. Get, get paid grandiosely in uh, uh, car wash ticket tokens. And <laughs> that good stuff, right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And uh, I've been in plays for University Theater, uh, which has been a lot of fun, again, when they need a bald, fat old man. And uh, I've been in plays for Civic Theater. And I do some writing, um, mainly about uh, growing up uh, in a very poor anthracite coal region where life was really rough, um, and about some of my experiences in, this, in Birmingham during the whole Birmingham sure. fiasco. Right. Um, and we bought hundreds and hundreds of books dating back to the 70s or 60s that we swore we were going to read that summer and that, of course, never materialized. Life at Purdue became such that uh, there was no time to just sit there and think anymore. You just did, 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 did. There's this old theatrical joke uh, where the director, uh, instead of screaming up at an actress, uh, you know, don't just do something, stand there. Uh, he screams up instead, you know, uh, <laughs> the opposite of that. Uh, and uh, there was no time to just stand there. Uh, it, it's, uh, it was too bad because uh, you, you, it was very difficult to get to the next plateau of evolution in whatever you were doing right. at Purdue. And that's still true, unfortunately. Right, yeah. How about, uh, what is one of your fondest memories of Purdue? You got one you'd like to share with us? Almost all of them. Good. Uh, and. and probably not what one would normally expect. Um, I was awestruck by Purdue when I first arrived on the 9th of September that day. Uh, you could have toured the campus I came from in five minutes if you were very slow. <laughs> you know, uh, I walked and walked and walked around the campus, and if you remember, it, it just went up to the region of the Co-Rec Gym in those days, and then there were cornfields and pig farms. Uh, none of the dorms were there other than Carey Hall and, and uh, uh, the uh, Warren Hall and their sister dorms. Uh, then I walked and walked, and I thought the campus had no end. Uh, it, it was just a whole new world. I, never, I was here for two months before I ever walked in the Memorial Union because I'd never heard of a memorial union. I had a clue what you did in a memorial union. And I kept seeing these young kids walking out. And so I said, it's a dormitory. I mean, it, it seemed logical at the time somehow. Uh, then somebody said they ate uh, in that building. And I said, oh, they let you eat in there with all the students? And they said, I looked at me. They said, <laughs> and they took me in. And there were music rooms and writing rooms and thinking rooms and <laughs> eating places and whatever. And I was just gawking, you know, forever and ever. Uh, it was snowing one day, and my office was in Stanley Coulter, and I went for a walk to clear my brain, and I walked past the Hall of Music, and people were coming out on the steps, and... Uh, I said, what's in there? Because this was during a, a, a school weekday thing. And they said, well, the University Theater uh, is doing a play uh, and Dark of the Moon. And I looked, and my brain said, they're coming out because it's between act one and something, or two and something. So when they started to go in, <laughs> so did I. And I walked in. And I looked around, and I found a place nobody seemed to be sitting in, so I sat. And I saw this huge stage. I mean, our stage at Bloomsburg, <laughs> you 
know, was like this. If you put more than three people on the stage, you were dead. Uh, and so I, I listened to this, and I thought, you know, it was like the end of the world. Uh, the actors were good. They were, to me, brilliant. Uh, the play was moving. Uh, the scenery was beyond comparison. I was just totally awestruck that in a college or a university, this could happen. The same thing happened to me a few weeks later when now I, with regularity, walked by and the uh, men's glee club was singing and the doors were open. It was springtime now and I could hear the music. And I walked up and in and the music was just overwhelming. I mean, the place I came from, if you could breathe, you were automatically in any choir you wanted to be in. You know, the only prerequisite was, can you stand and not drop over? Uh, and it didn't matter what the quality was, we just needed people. <laughs> and here were people who, you know, I would kill to be able to sing like, and there, the, you know, there they were, just little things like that where I discovered that life was not Bloomsburg uh, or anthracite or Anything you know, like that there that, was a lot you know. more to it than that. Right. And of course, when I met my wife, uh, that was a whole new chapter that totally changed my life in, right. in many, many ways. Right. But just little things like eating toast and bean soup. Uh, when Art's drugstore closed on Main Street, I, I was furious. I, I know Norbarth, and I cornered him in a basketball game, and I said, what are you doing, you know? This should be enshrined in gold, because this is where I was hired to stay at Purdue, literally. <laughs> and uh, you're, you're closing this mecca. <laughs> uh, do you have an outstanding event in your life? Outstanding? Yeah, you know, something come to mind? I'm a biologist. If I wake up in the morning and I'm alive, uh, it's a wonderful day, and if I remember my name nowadays, it's icing on the cake, you know, it's sort of, you know. Uh, any closing comments that you'd like to share with the researchers? Anything special that, comes that you'd like to share? Only that it was a privilege being here for 45 years. Uh, in many ways, we're still here in, in some ways. Purdue, Purdue treated us all in all over the years superbly. Uh, the one thing I would have had different would have been that uh, teachers aren't any better and they're not any worse than researchers. This is a battle we will never win, uh, but the battles were worth fighting and I think Martha and I both fought them. Uh, the other battle I certainly joined once I got married, uh, that women aren't any better than men. Uh, but they're not any worse either, and they can become president. Uh, and that battle, to some extent, has been uh, at least bridged. I'm not sure it's been won. Um, I, I have to see whether there will be one token president and one token this, uh, and then we go back to zero on the Monopoly board. Uh, but for many years, I thought women were second-hand citizens at Purdue, uh, my wife included, and I found it a very painful, uh, degrading uh, sort of thing uh, that made me ashamed in many ways that uh, in a very intelligent environment where everybody, from the students to you know anybody, uh, even the janitors were very intelligent students <laughs> much of the time. Uh, that uh, this would, you know, prevail. My wife had to fight like hell to uh, just even get the uh, women athletes, for God's sake, into the Big Ten conference and the NCAA uh, conference. Uh, and now it's taken for granted, sort of. Uh, but the athletic director at the time st did speak to us till the day he died. Uh, it, it, it was, hmm. you know, uh, just like I fear for not only Obama's but Hillary's health once they win or not win. I, I fear for their assassination. Uh, that, that's not that severe an atmosphere at Purdue, but you fear that uh, the things in biology are cyclical. And uh, if you live long enough, some of the battles you thought you've won, you didn't. <laughs> uh, there just was a pause in history and then 
history gets starts getting rewritten a titch. But my battle was that teachers do something which a lot of researchers don't have time to do, and that is to take the work of many people who are brilliant researchers and bring it together in ways that none of the individual researchers quite possibly ever thought of within their lifetime, uh, to be able to go and bring it together for young students to learn from the very beginning rather than have to do in a library, for example, literature searches or on a computer or whatever. That from the very beginning, they can learn that if this one could just do this and this one could just do this, just see what uh, somebody else, a third person, could make of it uh, de novo. And uh, I've never met a researcher willing to admit this. Uh, they're, they're, their ego tripping is as bad as mine, I suppose. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, well, this concludes the interview. I want to thank you thank very, you very much. much. My pleasure. Thank you very much. <clears throat> thank you.